<laughs> All right. I think maybe things have slowed a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with my welcome. So hi, welcome everyone to Gold Mountain Big City, a talk with local map expert, Jim Shine. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. For those of you unfamiliar with mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest in fact, designed to serve the public in California, a cultural event center, and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Right now, due to the shelter in place, almost all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Our speaker today is Jim Shine, who, along with his wife, Marty, owns and operates Shine and Shine Old Map Store on Grant Street in North Beach, which is a delight to go and visit, but right now it's in the process of transitioning to an online presence. Um, so there will be more to love online <laughs> from the comfort of your living room. Jim is, a, <laughs> Jim is a regular speaker and a stalwart supporter of the Mechanics Institute. And if we were hosting this event in person right now, you would be enjoying a fabulous reception in his honor. Uh, I hope that we all get through this time safely and in good health so that we can see each other and break bread together again with Jim in our library. Uh, Gold Mountain Big City is Jim's first book and a wonderful examination of Ken Cathcart's illustrated map of Chinatown from 1947. It is one of the most beautiful books that I have ever seen and it's available for sale at your local bookstore or at Al Alexander Book Company on Third Street and it will be added to our library collection uh, shortly. Now let me explain briefly how this is going to work tonight. Jim has an enormous amount of content to share with you, so we want to get going. Um, first of all, let me tell you that we are using the webinar version of Zoom, so it is normal for you to not see yourself and just see myself and Jim. Um, uh, this is so that all eyes can be on Jim's content and um, the gorgeous illustrations that he has to show you. Uh, questions, however, will be taken. Uh, please post them in the chat space and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end of the talk. All right, thank you all for coming tonight and thank you, Jim. Let's go ahead and get started. I guess that's my cue. All right, <laughs> it's nice to be here, uh, virtually or any other way. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to come and sit down a bit and take a look at my first and latest creation, uh, a book entitled Gold Mountain Big City. Uh, it's the culmination of uh, years of collecting uh, and uh, finally getting things published. Uh, I want to thank the Mechanics Institute for hosting me, a marvelous entity who uh, I've done work and things for in the past. I love speaking at their venue. Uh, you should consider joining. Um, the, it is inexpensive and it is a great private facility, the first library in the Western US. It is the oldest and a great 1854 starting point, of course, a great historic reference. Uh, and I do enjoy uh, their presence. In fact, uh, their presence is half the reason this book got published. In fact, it was uh, the administrative and librarian staff there who encouraged me greatly to pursue uh, the publisher who did in fact publish our book, Cameron Press. And, uh, and through that relationship, uh, this came to fruition. So um, uh, it's with great thanks and gratitude that, uh, that I'm here today. Uh, the book itself uh, is called Gold Mountain Big City, uh, the, one, of the, one of the Chinese names for uh, San Francisco. Um, I think I'll do a screen share and get us into a PowerPoint. Everybody should see a uh, character for Gold Mountain Big City coming off of uh, the cartouche of the map. Uh, this is our title uh, derived, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from uh, colloquialism, a uh, name for San Francisco applied from the beginning. Uh, as the big city. Uh, Gold Mountain refers to uh, 
uh, some great stories that are referred to in the gold history period and gold rush. Um, since it's a book, uh, some people might be here to uh, see how a book is made and how one might get an idea and have something like that come to fruition. Others might be here because of their love of history, others because of the love of the photography. Um, the book does have an incredible archive. Uh, the story starts, I'm going to synopsis the introduction to Gold Mountain Big City in a, a bio, a collection and the discovery and, and a bit of the intro. Um, the collection came to us in 2004 when Marty and I opened the store on Grant Avenue. And with that, neighbors kind of came out of the woodwork and one in particular named Laura Dorenzo said, I have some maps and you should come and buy them. And indeed, we went to her house and the basement was filled with a collection of maps that she had uh, attained from a man who had lived a, a decade earlier and passed away and was a friend of hers. And she felt compelled to save all of that. And we bought that from her and with it came uh, uh, a collection of maps, several hundred, uh, that uh, were essentially two piles. One was a pile of reference material of a style of maps, and the other pile was the creation of one individual, and with it came a photographic collection uh, that uh, was big. It was a box of about 5,000 negatives, 40 millimeter and 35 millimeter negatives, and uh, something that uh, was unexpected. Uh, in fact, we'd bought the maps and it was several months later that Laura came and handed off the photos and I said, what's this? And she said, oh, it's yours. You bought it months ago. And it was something she'd found as she was divesting of things in her home. But it was all of Ken's life work, uh, Ken, I mentioned. So we have a man we discover who is a, a map maker named Ken Cathcart and he creates hand colored maps and he sells them in the middle of the 20th century. And he uses other materials similar to his to illustrate, <clears throat> excuse me, to illustrate uh, history through iconography. Um, for us, we took his maps and I had them hand watercolored and with them came the Chinatown map, which was a sepia tone artist proof in vague content and almost illegible and very cryptic. One of the reasons that I decided to decipher that one first. Um, and we uh, had them uh, cleaned up and hand colored and photoshopped so that we then created a product and with that uh, we started to develop the photos and have them transferred from an analog format of commercial 40 millimeter negatives into a digital format of very high resolution, very, very high resolution uh, photos that could then be used and used in a contemporary pr uh, presentation. Um, we, in 2016, finally printed one of the maps. We printed the Chinatown map as a chromolithographic, chromolithographic representation and uh, very modern, but also very archaic and in the style of which it was originally made. Um, and then uh, we started with the help of staff at Shine and Shine uh, to research uh, the content of this map and try to decipher what it is. Uh, with it, we discovered the support of the photographic record that we had uh, in the creation of these maps. And so we started writing text about it and created a manuscript uh, in 2016. So this process from 2004 to 2016 gets us through the process of managing the actual product and then at the end, uh, getting a, a manuscript together for presentation. Uh, with the help of Lee Bruno, a published author with Cameron Press, who's a good author with uh, um, several good books about San Francisco and San Francisco history, uh, and the support of David Plant and Plant Construction and the Plant Historic Library. Uh, the book was underwritten and produced by Cameron Press of Petaluma. Uh, up there we had Chris Gruner and Jan Hughes and Ian Morris really doing the uh, orchestration, the, the editing of my 450 page manuscript to 150 pages, and the taking of the 450 or 500 PDFs and photographs I'd correlated with that manuscript and text to lay it out the way that it's been. A lot of work uh, and an uh, incredible amount of endeavors that got us to uh, the beginning of 2019 and then to the end of the year getting that work done and a release date of March 2020. So here we are. Uh, I think we released date on the date that I went into shelter in Glen Ellen, and I've been up here ever since. Um, ultimately, the book itself uh, starts and it winds up being about this map. Uh, the introduction gets us to a point where we have a final map, which I have produced from a sepia tone artist proof from Cathcart's collection. Um, and we start to research it with his own photographs and with the uh, availability of a uh, libraries and academic collections of today to try to decipher uh, the meaning of this map. It's titled A San Francisco's Chinatown and Environs 
a scrapbook map, with well, scrapbooking being literally a larger drawing cut out and reduced photolithographically, hand laid, overlaid, rephotographed, and in the end done so in a monochrome black and white palette, and then hand watercolored in its time. Labor intensive and archaic to say the least. Our map maker starts us with chapter one in the book. And here's a self-portrait of Ken Cathcart, uh, a man uh, with a Leica. And uh, uh, moving here, uh, we see his first Christmas in San Francisco, uh, 1937. Um, among other things, he received a Leica camera um, uh, with a visit from his father, a known musician, a, a, an underwritten and published musician. Uh, Cathcart does some fairly typical uh, art student layout uh, composition, uh, which is very telling, uh, both in his interests, um, but also uh, we do have a newspaper that gives us December 27th, uh, 1937, uh, an exact date of when this was transpiring. And if we notice the film vials uh, in the middle of the image, those are the exact film vials that Laura Dorenzo handed me uh, some 75 years later, uh, filled with the negatives, which were taken at this time. Uh, and this is what I did my research with. So it was a great privilege to have the original research and life's work of the map maker and artist. Uh, his residence, his first day, a new camera, new city, nice shot looking down California Street to the west around Hyde. Um, very quickly, uh, Cathcart uh, developed a relationship with B.S. Fong. And in 1938, Fong asked him uh, not only to photograph his family and other members of the community, but also to act as a... Um, uh, public representative and promoter uh, photographically and with text uh, for the um, China War Relief uh, of America, a, a, a fundraising by the Chinese American community uh, in response to the Second Sino Japanese War, War in Manchuria with Japan invading Manchuria. Uh, <clears throat> it was the Consolidated uh, Benevolent Association, uh, the six companies who were uh, essentially the hosts of this and Cathcart's hosts. And ultimately as such, he was granted great access to the Chinese American community, uh, asked to document uh, the important meetings. Uh, we see B.S. Fong in the middle of this in the background uh, and other members of the community uh, here uh, in the China war relief efforts. We see uh, street scenes of high school girls uh, raising funds, uh, walking around raising donations around Chinatown and events um, like the YMC Harmonica Band uh, performing uh, here to, again, raise money, uh, perhaps with uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen there in the background. Um, we have uh, the privilege of Cathcart with these hosts of being able to document life on the streets in a pre-war Chinatown uh, as a invited guest. Um, and the privilege was not wasted on him. Uh, and we see that through his photographic record. Uh, so everything from the local news community and the merchant community, uh, the goods on the streets, uh, local young businessmen, the shoeshine kids, uh, but also more relevant, uh, the newspaper men of China. Here's a, uh, Chinua Li and uh, Cameron Place. Ultimately, uh, that led to also more credible entities like uh, Stidger and Stidger. Stidger and Stidger are the uh, preeminent law firm uh, in the Montgomery block who uh, represented uh, Chinese Americans in the majority of civil rights and uh, immigration litigation. Uh, they were uh, paramount in the support of Sun Yat-sen and his uh, stay in the United States in the writing of the Constitution for the Republic of China uh, from 1912 to 1949, a independent and democratically elected Chinese Republic. Uh, so Stidger and Stidger and the newspaper men and Ben Fong got Cathcart a residence in the Montgomery block. And by 1938, Ken Cathcart was living among 75 other artists, writers, poets, painters, muralists like Robert Stackpole and Maynard Dixon uh, in this neighborhood. Ultimately, the Bohem, uh, the uh, working artist and creative entrepreneur in many cases, self-promoting. Uh, Cathcart worked then for the Chinese uh, Benevolent Society of the Six Companies for the next five to 10 years, and at the end of that period, um, became uh, quite adept at the understanding of Chinatown. Um, coincidentally, the Montgomery block is the site of 
the Transamerica Pyramid today. Uh, it was a very important building, first fireproof building in San Francisco. Uh, it remained there until 1959. It's also where Pisco Punch was invented and Duncan McNichol. And uh, until the last day of prohibition, uh, where we see the last day of uh, alcohol being served legally at the Bankers Exchange in the Montgomery Block, and we see some pretty sad cops there. Uh, anyway, um, Cathcart also was aware by being in the Montgomery Block that he wasn't just close to Chinatown, he was in Telegraph Hill. And we see the documentation of this community at the same time in the early cottages. <clears throat> this would be Montgomery Street on the 1300 block. We see Alta Street in the background uh, right here. And if we go to the next image, we see the same house and reference. Um, we'll take note of the sand dunes and the sea grasses and ultimately the environ in 1935-37 is still at the beach, even though we're on the east side of San Francisco. The dunes and sands of the west are coming and settling here. Um, and as we continue on, we see that Cathcart is cognizant of the fact that he's not the first person to document that which he has been asked to document. That is to say, the community of Chinatown and the community of Telegraph Hill and the history of San Francisco. Um, here is a uh, previous 1870s photograph by Curtis Watkins, an important photograph of the same neighborhood and the same houses on Alta Street and Montgomery uh, 50 years before his time. Cathcart also was aware of maps and the mapping of Chinatown. Uh, this map was seminal in the creation and reinforcement of legislation from 1882, which under uh, critical uh, hindsight we see is an act to exclude the Chinese from all activities from immigration, uh, from ownership of land, from right to marry, uh, but also to the limitations of the type of employment uh, that one could attain. Uh, this map is the first map to document a ghetto and a color code. Uh, it is in fact, um, showing us uh, white prostitution in blue, green prostitution is Chinese, uh, yellow is opium resorts, uh, red is joss houses, uh, the tan is general Chinese occupancy, and the gambling houses are pink. Um, this is, none of these activities are illegal, all of these activities are immoral. Um, this map is used to enact moralist legislation against the Chinese, which remained fully until 1943, when it started to be repealed, and then not until 1965, and in the end, 1968, were these laws finally removed from the American law books. Nonetheless, this map reinforced uh, a generalization that was in place already uh, three years later. <clears throat> Other maps followed, which included more promotional maps by the Chinese American community, which really listed uh, a business and its function and what they sold, uh, we also see a land use map a little later in 1929, showing the growth of the Chinatown community, um, expansion beyond Chinatown, beyond the previous borders in which one was mandated, one must live if you were of Chinese or in fact Asian ancestry. Um, we see the boundaries of Chinatown have expanded, also to include the, the East Bay, as well as to include representation on Angel Island. Angel Island is an immigration station. And as such, Angel Island does have uh, some merits in that despite it being a horrific spot, um, it does provide representation for a group of people that by legislation have no legal representation and in fact legally do not exist. Um, this is a dichotomy of the time. Excuse me. <clears throat> Other more celebratory maps also uh, start to follow and here in 1939 with the Golden Gate International Exposition transpiring in the Treasure Island in the middle of the bay. We see Ethel Chung's map of Chinatown celebrating the landmarks and in a bright and colorful fashion. Um, we see the illustrated or animated map, a 20th century American style of mapping, which is very much cartoon, very much celebratory, and very much uh, a, a local thing. Uh, just in that, here's the actual map for the guidebook for the Golden Gate, and it's done by Ruth Taylor White, who is the most uh, well paid illustrator in this style in the country. She has an office on the top floor of the call building on the corner of Third and Market. Uh, this is one of her more subtle and subdued pieces, despite having uh, dragons and water dragons and some other animated and colorful aspects. This, in fact, is fairly subdued for her. 
Cathcart decided this is what he would do. He would become an illustrated map maker. And following the Second World War, he started producing maps, historic maps. And these are some of his first few maps before the Chinatown map, the 1946 map of old downtown. Um, is a marvelous piece. Um, and it refers to the 1848 to 1870 San Francisco. Um, we also then have a similar map for the Bay Area. And one which I'm working on now for my second book um, is the sketch map of California, where the uh, western side of the map depicts the early rancho history of California, the first colonialization. Um, and then the, west, the eastern side of the map depicts the gold rush and the uh, Americanization and uh, colonization population of California uh, from 1850 to 1870. Uh, an interesting story and one that Cathcart had done just the year before producing our Chinatown map. This map has a lot of material about the Chinese American community among others and probably helped his reinforcement for the creation of this map. So here we are. That's a mouthful. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I think we're moving pretty well. Um, this is a marvelous piece. The map is filled with icons. It's in fact, uh, two distinct maps, the outer border and the inner map. And we're gonna go with the outer border initially. Uh, the uh, map itself has been broken down into a grid, uh, which is displayed on page 35 of the book. And it's very helpful because you can always go back and reference and you can pick and choose uh, both imagery or stories uh, to get an idea. I call the book Chinatown 101 to some degree because I think these are uh, very subtle. The icons Cathcart used as references to the historic stories, which uh, might have been a paragraph or three, but through a single icon could in fact uh, evoke the story and, uh, and then uh, prompt one to research its content. And so we've done that research and have kind of outlined that in a structure in the book. Um, so it's very fun. Uh, the grid uh, is, linear in its approach goes A through Z around the outer border and then one through nine across the top and A through G along the X, Y axes. Um, it does have a typo at the beginning of chapter two. Sadly, um, what we have is 177 icons within 89 spaces. And that's how chapter two, chapter two should start. Um, these icons, as I mentioned, each are a story. And we're gonna start with the outer border um, because it is a story, in fact, unto itself, uh, that is more historic than it is uh, perceived in the moment. And it is the story of the Chinese-American diaspora, 1847-1947. Uh, and it, uh, it poses the common history of the resident of Chinatown um, that is uh, felt to be important uh, by both the Chinese American community and the community of Chinatown, but also uh, to be recognized as should be taught to the Westerner, the visitor, uh, the San Franciscan who is not a resident of Chinatown. Um, starting with the creation of the Democratic Republic of China, uh, the fall of the Manchu Empire uh, and its uh, abdication and the creation of Sun Yat-sen's Chinese Republic. Um, many people my age or older grew up celebrating 1010 parades uh, the 1010 aspect is the creation of that China, which was pre-communist China and post-Chinese uh, dynasty. Um, a very select window, uh, but also a window which created some of the best Chinese-American relations uh, then and since. Um, with it, we have um, events that are transpiring uh, that show the relationship between uh, these uh, cultures and ultimately we're here seen uh, flags of the American flag and what we'd see today as the Taiwanese flag, uh, but it's in fact the Republic of China flag, uh, flying from uh, a family building on uh, Waverly Place. Um, we also then see uh, icons relating to the history, historically, of the Chinese uh, contribution and experience with both the construction of the railways and the uh, lure of gold into the gold fields on uh, the Chinese camps. In fact, uh, as I'd mentioned, Cathcart's previous 1946 map of gold country uh, in great detail showed the Chinese American uh, experience in uh, the Chinese camp, uh, uh, the number of Tong uh, houses, uh, Tong wars, uh, family um, uh, temples known as Joss houses, uh, Joss being uh, incense, and incense being burned in front. The English wrongly called these Joss houses. Um, the reason for them being on the Chinese exclusion map of 1885 um, was not because these were family buildings were perhaps uh, 
something uh, banking or money or Tong Wars or anything like this. It was, it was that uh, temples were Buddhism and Buddhism was paganism. Uh, it was uh, idol worship. Um, so these were some of the, the viewpoints of the Christian viewpoint of the Chinese that's, that's uh, going on in the Chinese community uh, in California, 1847 to 1947. Um, Cathcart's awareness of this is shown in his maps. Also, um, with it, we have the limitations of jobs that if you're of Chinese ancestry that you may do in the United States. And they include uh, C, uh, D, F, and G. Uh, and he is taking pictures of these persons um, in portraiture in great quantity. And some of them are quite nice. This is one of my favorite. This guy has a beautiful sweater and he's the owner of the uh, California Shrimp Company down at Hunter's Point, um, which by 1938, all of these camps were removed uh, for uh, safety reasons for the war effort. And they removed all businesses off the waterfront, uh, all non-white businesses. Um, we also see the restaurant labor. Um, we see the laundry labor. Uh, we see the farmer um, in the Delta in this case. Uh, and we see the teacher or scholar. Uh, and we have teachers of music. Uh, it was a very common and one of the most practiced and celebrated. Um, Cathcart's uh, photographs that we have the record of are emulations of daily life and that's really reflected. So we have a photograph which shows um, then what is drawn as an illustration and then what is presented on the map. Uh, and so we have a, a direct correlation from real life to historic reference uh, in the creation and that's represented well in the book with the PDFs. Um, other examples, of course, would be his illustration of the telephone exchange, but he would also have a reference like a 1906 postcard of the telephone exchange um, and want to go with certain traditions to promote that which was already vetted by the Chinese American community to promote Chinatown. Um, <clears throat> an interesting side point, the Chinese telephone building is a phenomenal building, which the original structure was hand hewn in Canton and brought over by a vessel and reconstructed. And the reason is that the telephone was not entirely excluded from the Chinese, but use and the technologies had to be done by peace, people of Chinese descent. And so all phone calls for Chinatown went to this exchange and there would be men prior to the earthquake and women after the earthquake who knew the spatial knowledge, they knew every family, they knew everybody's name, their relationship to other families, they knew where they lived, they knew where the family building was, they knew where their cousins lived, and they knew the capacity well enough to pull it up in 10 seconds or less to be able to patch you through to that number in that home. Uh, an incredible knowledge of community and an incredible knowledge of spatial memory and as a map person, just phenomenal job skill. Um, so something that I, I think about frequently because it was a result of exclusion that this was created but what it created was an incredible um, contained knowledge of one's community. And it wasn't exclusive to the women and men working at the telephone directory. It was a, a privileged knowledge of the resident of Chinatown and remained to be so, and is to some degree today still so, one to be respected in that regard. Um, we also have uh, Cathcart representing the children of Chinatown. In many cases, these are the uh, children of merchants, and he's emulating Arnold Gente's photographs. Arnold Gente is a phenomenal turn of the century photographer. He worked in North Beach in Chinatown. His office and location was above Mr. Bing's at the corner of Pacific and uh, Columbus approximately. And he was the first person to take the Chinese American community and represent it to the Western American community, European American community in a favorable light. And he did so with photographs of children and the costumes and the celebration of youth. And in doing so, after a generation or two of villainizing the Chinese in the press and in the culture, we started to see a softer presentation. And Cathcart is picking up on this and ultimately taking that into account in his documentation of the community. Now, these kids, of course, built these shoe kits themselves and uh, would work uh, good hours and make decent money uh, shining shoes. Also an interesting point that laundry, despite its Chinatown, despite its segregated, despite exclusion, laundry is an important business in the Chinese community and unions are important in San Francisco. And so here we see the Chinese garment workers union local 
uh, the international labor union uh, unionizing people who in fact legally may not have full legal representation. So this is an important step and an important uh, aspect to Chinatown uh, in the reality of 1937, uh, when the majority of this is happening. Cathcart is aware of where he is and the documentation of what he's doing. He's got life on the street, <clears throat> and life on the street here at the corner of Commercial and Grant Avenue, right across from Hang Far Low, is an intersection that's been documented before. In fact, just a couple of years before, in a book called Chinatown, done by Sidem and Doby, Sidem the illustrator, and Charles Doby, the author, a man who was raised within the Chinese community, one of the first really flattering books about Chinatown is written. And in it is the documentation of this wall. And we see uh, Sidem's drawing of this same intersection. And we see the integrity of the photograph and Sidem's uh, integrity and in what he's presenting. Uh, of Chinatown. Um, and this is the wares and the name of the business and what they sell. Um, and Cathcart uh, simplifies it, takes some liberties, um, but does include it. And, and in doing so, it is acknowledging uh, that he is uh, following in the footsteps of others. Uh, in fact, he's presenting a Chinatown uh, that is, again, partly vetted by the community to promote Chinatown to those who don't live there. Um, established protocols, if you will. That gets into chapter three. I'm doing, moving along pretty good. I had to clear my throat. Uh, apple cider, <clears throat> my favorite. And we look at the Chinatown and Barbary Coast stories. We have about 156 icons left. And with that, we have an incredible array of history and geographically, the majority of it is Chinatown. Um, what we find is that Cathcart is living in the Montgomery block. That's right here. Um, with the Montgomery block being central to both Chinatown over here, it is also part of the Barbary Coast. The Barbary Coast is an area that's uh, notorious San Francisco history coming from about 1850 well up to about 1917 when Prohibition pretty well shut it down. Um, Cathcart in 1937 is living there and has the privilege of documenting the success of Chinatown and the rebirth of the Barbary Coast. And with that, we have a title, which again, the scrapbook mapping, uh, Cathcart left us, and thanks to Laura Dorenzo, uh, all of his process, all of his little scrapbook drawings, all of the original, the, the cable car and the donkey up in the upper left corner is about a foot long and I still have it. And it was, you know, hand colored and it, all of these things were laid on top and photographed and super labor intensive, but he uh, made a very nice linear map. And in the corners, we see the gaming of Chinatown, uh, where we celebrate the lottery, uh, Fantan, chess, and Mahjong. Uh, chess uh, being a game of skill uh, believed to have originated in uh, early China. Um, uh, Fantan and Mahjong, more regional games. Mahjong in particular, a game where the names of the pieces are so regional that uh, people from specific communities play together because the names of the pieces vary so greatly between each town and have different functions. Um, but the game is uh, celebrated and played today and we hear it every day. And the Chinese lottery would have been posted and was a genuine lottery that paid off. And when a time when gambling was illegal, uh, this is a time where the Chinese community had its own uh, source of gaming. And it's very important and something that was uh, beyond the hand for the most part of the graft of uh, white established government. Um, with it, we see a lot of very graphic icons on the map. And one that grabbed my eye first uh, was this moth. And uh, with a little bit of time and putting my glasses on, um, I discovered that the moth is in fact a kite that is uh, being held up by a person down in uh, Portsmouth Square. And the kite is in fact uh, taken from an example of a tight kite that we have uh, from Cathcart's photographic library. Uh, showing a young man down at the Marina Green uh, behind Marina Middle School at a competition, showing uh, his kite off and, uh, and Cathcart using that as his model. Uh, kite store on Grant Avenue was there till the mid 80s and when they moved to the wharf and I'm sure they were probably there till the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, a very big part of the community and something that we remember, um, but a big part of uh, his map as a central icon to bring your eye down to the cartouche. Um, 
Cathcart is documenting the community and with it come his artist friends uh, and the proximity, the uh, statue of Dr. Sun Yat-sen in St. Mary's Park done by Benjamin Bufano. Bufano befriended Sen uh, when Sen was living in the United States. Bufano um, had a great uh, love of large public art and um, uh, others were in this community as well. We have Don Kingman um, who lived in the Montgomery Block, a famed Hong Kong-based New York and San Francisco artist, uh, well-known and celebrated in the 50s. Um, but we also have historical references to uh, previous characters of the last century and last generation. Uh, we have uh, Feng Chong, or Little Pete, uh, who was the Duke of Vice, uh, a San Franciscan or Peninsula-born. He was uh, started as a houseboy, working for the six companies, and over time got into other uh, other work outside of the six companies and became the Duke of uh, criminal activity. Um, he hired a, uh, a white bodyguard when a uh, bounty was placed on his head, a man who was called Lo Fan, uh, meant uh, foreign devil, um, or white devil is how we uh, now say it, but in fact, meant foreign devil. And uh, Lo Fan was hired because it was, because of the legislation and laws that felt that nobody would dare try to kill a white man who was defending uh, the Duke of Vice. He did actually die in the barbershop below where he lived in 1892 or so. Um, but he also references people like uh, Joshua Norton, a commodities rice broker who lost his mind and became the Emperor of the United States and Protectorate of Mes Mexico. Self-declared, of course. Um, but Cathcart does some very creative stuff where we see the Emperor Norton and he's got kind of a, a house in his arms. And what we realize is that's the house that's physically located at 624 Commercial Street, which is where he lived. And so we have some very ingenious little devices to, to impart some history to us in a very subtle way. We also reference the historic contributors to the Chinese American uh, migration into San Francisco and California with the 49ers, um, the slave trades of uh, both uh, the gold towns as well as San Francisco and St. Louis Alley, um, and also the merchants of the 1850s and the, the wealth that came in with this community with education and the first community to come in and be able to generate wealth um, with uh, something more than just their labor, with the sale of goods and the contribution and sale and purchase of further goods. Um, uh, with it also comes the celebration of everyday people, the Cathcart scene and his life. Uh, and the modern slit skirt uh, is a very good example. Here's a woman on Waverly Place, uh, who is walking uh, with a slit skirt. And this is a fashion style, which is discussed a bit, uh, originating from a very modern movement in the Chinese American community in the mid 1930s, pre-war. Um, we also see references to the restaurant trades um, and the idea of delivery food and tray man. The tray man gets a lot of attention. There are a lot of photographs of men uh, delivering food. When I say a lot, uh, out of a thousand photographs of Chinatown, there are probably 40. Um, that seems like a large percentage. Um, but uh, food delivery is novel. Food delivery is unique to Chinatown. Food delivery outside of Chinatown didn't exist until the 1960s in the United States, and that came with pizza. Today, when we're at home quite a bit and we're probably getting some food delivered, we might consider that contribution. Ultimately, part of that was that people were working either too hard um, or had jobs were too vital to leave their station and they worked a full shift. Um, this uh, often exploitation was also the benefit of uh, working uh, long days and short pay. Um, <laughs> but at the end, this was life in Chinatown and uh, the food and the transience of it being brought to you instead of you going to it um, was captivating to Cathcart at the time. Um, we also have good representation of the families of Chinatown and families of Chinatown have constructed buildings on Waverly Place and this um, uh, two block uh, street also known as Pike Place uh, is where all family buildings were and these often included uh, private family temples, uh, businesses uh, uh, owned by the family, banks and uh, the all nature of business in Chinatown uh, could originate in to these buildings uh, along Waverly as well as Grant Avenue. Um, Cathcart is aware of this through earlier documentation and earlier photographs. Here's a uh, 100 block of Waverly Place looking down at the Chan family building on Washington at the end. 
And here's a very comparable, similar view, uh, looking at the Chan building at the end of Washington Street, uh, right here. Um, this, by the way, is where Little Pete was killed. There's the barber pole. This is the barber shop. This is where Little Pete lived. So uh, Cathcart's really a great documentarian, and he's showing a community, community with schools. And here, uh, we not only have a photograph of the school, but we have it from the second story, which required some privilege to get into the second story of somebody's house. Um, we also have Commodore Stockton School uh, and a Chinese hospital. Uh, now newly reconstructed, the Chinese hospital uh, is a great point of pride and celebration in the Chinatown community. At a time of exclusion, if you were of Chinese descent, you could not go to a regular hospital. You were not provided welfare and care there. Ultimately, uh, the community of Chinatown very early on pooled their own resources and built a hospital. And this hospital built uh, in the 1920s uh, was a structure that just recently was removed for a building much larger and the growth of the community also is the growth of that hospital. And it's a great success story um, and a marvelous facility. And many people and some who are watching me today were born there. Uh, we also have representation of the Catholic Church in Chinatown, um, the crossroads of California and Grant Avenue. Uh, prior to the Second World War, in a lot of regard, Chinatown started at this point in the Sing Fat and Sing Chong retail temples at the corner uh, and heading north were the gates to Chinatown more as the Japanese community occupied the four and 500 blocks of uh, Grant Avenue, those being south of California Street, until the Article 41 removal of Japanese uh, to internment camps during the Second World War. Um, also prior to that, from the 1906 period on, the Japanese American community moved out both to rural communities as well as out to what we would call Japantown today or Fillmore. So migration as well as enforcement of internment uh, affected the Japanese there. Um, we also have a celebration of theater uh, and the documentation of same, uh, the Mandarin Theater on Grant Avenue. Um, my uh, forward, the gentleman who wrote the forward for the book, Gordon Chin, in fact, uh, grew up and lived above the Mandarin Theater as a child on Grant Avenue. Uh, he mentioned to me the other day, as kind of interesting to hear. Um, so he would hear um, these operatic uh, productions uh, at home in the evening. We also have the celebration of restaurants and the community that created them. Cathcart is celebrating and documenting a community that has great depth and breadth and one in which he has been welcomed to take photographs and to celebrate it with them. And it's a rare privilege, which um, when I found the collection, I was concerned about how the majority of them came about. But we find after the creation of this map, Cathcart continued his work in Chinatown, really just documenting the formalities and families and events uh, as a documentarian, more as a portraiture photographer. Um, and this was the town and the part of town that he chose to work. Um, this part of town had a very important role in freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Uh, and newspapers like the Young China, um, newspapers like China Digest, um, newspapers, um, this is China Digest, and uh, uh, we also have Dr. Poon Chu. Um, these are the three most important uh, newspapers in Chinatown at the time. Um, promoting uh, a repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, promoting uh, better Sino-American relations, uh, promoting uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen and his agenda and the Democratic Republic of China. And um, Dr. Poon Chu, starting in 1909, uh, was relentless in this and ultimately was instrumental. And the celebration of that within the Chinatown community um, was obviously a very strong undercurrent of, with, from his, his host families and the people with, with which he engaged. Um, we also see some kind of uh, just grabbing a uh, snapshot, the old bulletin board on Washington Street, which was where the tongs would announce um, if there was a bounty on your head and what the cost was, and also the lottery winners would be announced there. We have uh, the site of the first Chinese laundry, 1851, uh, being right next to that bulletin board. And we have the Peace Society mentioned um, up in the upper left-hand corner. The Peace Society being established around 1913 after a series of Tong Wars were so violent that it mandated a group 
to try to quell things and everybody came to the table. Um, these organizations uh, were strong in the community. Cathcart lived in 37 and just 36 or 34, the most recent of violent occurrences in both New York and San Francisco had really just quelled. And so it was fairly relevant to the world of the time and the world in which he lived. But he's also recognizing um, the depth and breadth of a culture which he knows very little about uh, and ultimately has a lot to teach him. And so he's made a great effort to try to um, present symbolism and uh, images like double happiness or uh, images of jade uh, to symbolize various stories that meant a great deal to the culture at large. Um, he also included things like the old podi, which was actually from Sidem's book. And this is the actual old, old podi. And it's a building on the corner of Clay and Grant in which um, a uh, transaction between the tenant and the landlord uh, ended in a dispute unresolved. And the tenant departed uh, with a loss. And the landlord um, cannot functionally rent the building. No one will rent the building and the building is presumed cursed, if you will. And until that um, slight, until that bad business dealing is resolved, uh, no one will rent the building. And it, it's a charming story and one that ultimately I was a bit dubious of because of its romanticism. But in fact, Cathcart documents the space being empty. It's being documented in Sidem's book in 1935, and it's documented as being empty till the mid 1950s when it is ultimately resolved. Um, so, uh, so these are things that explain sometimes why a space is empty, um, but also it explains some of the undercurrent of ethics of a community that is unique uh, to his perspective and would be unique to us. With that comes his representation of the underworld and we have a lot of shadowy figures, and since they are shadowy figures, they're half figures. Um, this is right at the entrance of Waverly Place coming off of Sacramento Street on the map, and it really is a represent representation of the hatchet wars of the 1880s, where um, hired high binders, they were called, were hired guns to um, fight it out on Waverly Place between the families for control of various industries or underworld activities. Um, with it comes prostitution. Um, Commercial Street was the center of not just Chinese, but also white prostitution, as we saw on the Chinatown uh, map of 1885. Um, I happen to have found a business card for uh, the very famous mansion of Madame Lazarine and Ladies at 730 Commercial Street, who operated here for, uh, with impunity for almost 45 years. Um, so that was kind of a rare find that's in, included in the book. And, kind of representative of the, uh, the documentation that I collected over 30, maybe 13, 15 years um, based on my interest in Chinatown businesses and San Francisco business. And with it comes a lot of PDFs, a lot of imagery that uh, support our uh, stories. Cathcart's also documenting the underground San Francisco of pre-1906, which were the connected passageways in a community where you don't have representation. Sometimes it's safer to stay underground and just going above ground is a reason to get hassled by the authorities, by somebody who wants to take your money, by whatever. Um, and so in fact, uh, not just nefarious activities transpire underground. And many of these buildings had sidewalk connections, um, and as many still do today, and just because of the uh, topography, as we build into the hillsides, often our sidewalks are hollow, as is the case with Shine and Shine on Grant Avenue on the 1500 block. Our basement used to connect to our neighbor's basement with, with the passageway. Um, until we bought it 20 years ago. So that's not that uncommon, but uh, its usage prior to 1906 was a pathway to gambling and prostitution, uh, enslavement. Um, it was often really pretty nefarious, and the stories that go with it are, are pretty horrific. Um, uh, opium is a big business. Um, it's not the Chinese who are necessarily smoking opium. It is uh, the tourist who is making use of that 1885 exclusion map to see where the opium resorts are and go down and partake or watch. There literally are tourist events of people taking tours of Chinatown to go and visit these opium dens. Cathcart had a good time making this map and with it he really almost was maybe making it for himself. Um, and I say that because this icon, the GE, is something that it's a great reference and it meant something to him. 
<laughs> but what would it mean to me was really debatable. Uh, so it took us a while, and uh, and it was our it was uh, Aubrey Mladenovic who was working on something, and and realized that uh, Mark Twain and Bret Hart had worked at a newspaper called The Golden Era, and it was located on the 700 block of Montgomery. And this is the building. And so here's his photograph of where the golden era was in 1937-38, which is really down in the Barbary Coast in the Washington Broom Company. And it's really kind of interesting because at the time, it's Maynard Dixon's studio. And his wife, Dorothea Lang, famed American photographer, uh, work out of the second floor of this building as one of the most important Western muralists and photographers uh, to come out of San Francisco. And this happens to be their studio, but that's not why Cathcart's photographing it. He's photographing it is because uh, this is where, in fact, uh, uh, Bret Hart and, and Mark Twain, great satirists and writers whom he admired. Uh, Cathcart, his maps came about as a result of being a failed writer. Um, his icons were better than his text. And so ultimately, um, his reference to GE, it was enough that we could figure it out. And so with it, we see his homage to some of the influences. Um, Old Chinatown was Arnold Gente's uh, 1903 reprinted in 1908, photographic book, um, uh, softening and humanizing the Chinese community in the United States and in San Francisco's Chinatown. We have Dobie's uh, and Sidem's Chinatown of 1935, of which we see the comparison of imagery you had shown earlier. And then we have other things where Cathcart is uh, placing himself in literary history as a historian and as a researcher. And as researchers, we had a great time with this map because you have 177 icons to research. Um, this one was, uh, in shorthand, first book printed in California, 1849. And it has an X, and that X is on Clay Street, approximately. And, and it says life in California on the book, which is, in fact, incorrect. So life in California was not published in California. It was a 1946 book published in Brooklyn, New York. Um, first book printed in California technically would have been the manifesto done by... Juan Figueroa, the Franciscan monk who was handing over California to the missionaries in 1835 and would have been in Spanish. So the first book printed in California in English turns out to be a book called Life As It Is and As It Will Be. And it was done by a guy who wound up going down in history and as being almost forgotten. And the Grabhorn Press did a reprint of the book in 1935, and I've actually had that in my library. So I grabbed it and looked at it. And it turns out that Cathcart was kind of right. Um, the first book printed in California was printed at 8 Clay Street, where he has the X. And it, in fact, was uh, California, as it is and as it would, would be. Um, it is not this book, but it was done there. It was published by Washington Bartlett. So uh, my point, long story, but that kind of research was a ton of fun. Um, but it also shows that uh, despite being a very uh, articulate and capable researcher, he got some things wrong. And he also made some uh, generalizations and also some things that in our contemporary vernacular would be oversteps uh, racially, um, either usurpment of culture or uh, just racist. Um, but the intention, the vetted uh, intention of the promotion, this is a celebratory map, uh, and ultimately um, he's trying to present a celebratory uh, in, uh, presentation. The Barbary Coast was one of his last influences. It's a 1933 book that discusses all of the gangs of both Chinatown, but also the Sydney Ducks, and all of the Barbary Coast history, which of course is his neighborhood. And so the map outside of Chinatown is documenting his daily life in his neighborhood and its historical importance. And he lists all the great uh, dance halls and all the great uh, prostitution venues and all the great theaters. Um, and he does so in a kind of uh, even-handed, uh, matter-of-fact way that uh, is happy and illustrated, but also uh, just when we look at Pacific Avenue, known as Terrific Street, we see a half figure clubbing another half figure. Um, it's, you know, not without its honesty in regards to the violence um, that transpires. It also acknowledges some of the ironies of San Francisco down in the bottom. They said, if, as they say, God spanked the town for being over frisky, 
why'd he burn the churches down and spare Hodling's whiskey? And this is a great ditty done by Field um, discussing in the great earthquake and fire of 06 how 